I'll go down the list of people as they are listed in the participant group and invite you to do a brief introduction of yourself uh, before we get started. And uh, the first person on that list is Augustus Z, who is really uh, Brad's alter ego. That's not a real someone. It's uh, the one he uses to monitor what you guys are seeing out there in the world. So that takes us to Carol McQuiggan. Carol, introduce yourself, please. Good morning, Carol McQuiggan from Penn State Harrisburg. I run the Faculty Center for Teaching and Instructional Technology. Thanks. Thanks, Carol. Uh, Christine, you're next. Christine, if you don't have a mic, you can just type something in the chat box. Christine's typing right now. Okay, great. Christine says, good morning. No mic here, but I'm in World Campus Marketing. Thank you, Christine. George Cronin. Ah, George says, good morning. No mic. PSU at Harrisburg. Adjunct for the criminal justice program. I guess that's Trim J. If not, you can correct me. Okay, good. Uh, Heather Harder. Okay, I'm not hearing or seeing anything from Heather. Heng Tao is uh, also in the room, so we'll let him introduce himself later mm -hmm. on. Uh, Kate Miffitt. Kate, introduce yourself, please. Heather Harder says she has Hi. a stubborn microphone. Go ahead, Kate. Hi, this is Kate Miffitt. I'm the Director of Digital Media, Pedagogy, and Scholarship in the College of Liberal Arts. Glad you could make it, Kate. Uh, Lawrence Christopher Reagan's Larry Reagan, my colleague and co-director of COIL. Larry, what else do we know about you? All right, well, I'll, I'll mention that he may not be at his microphone right now. <laughs> he, uh, okay, that's enough about that. Steve Schaefer. <laughs> Oh, Steve Same Schaefer typed, hello, I'm from IST, and I've run CompSci 101 online for seven years. Thank you. Okay, Tricia. I know Mike here. I'm in World Campus Marketing. Thank you. Uh, Vicki Hoffman. Morning, Senior Support and Training Analyst for AIS. Thank you for joining us. Yellum. Ellen wanted to be here with us today in person, but she couldn't, so she was participating from home, and I'm not seeing anything from her at the moment. So we'll march around the room. We'll come back and end with Eric, who will introduce himself right before he begins. So Brad, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Brad Zdenek. I'm the uh, Educational Planning and Strategy Manager for the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. Chris? Chris Gamrad. I'm an Instructional Designer in the College of IST. I'm also the PI for the COIL grant, the uh, Lifelong Learning Landscape, which is the Penn State Digital Badging uh, Initiative. John. Hi, uh, John Foster, uh, CEO at uh, NAFI. We do uh, technical certifications in about uh, 110 different uh, occupational areas. Pat Show. Pat Show, Fire Learning Catherine. Catherine Augustine, Academic Advisor for College Education. Hang Tao. Uh, I'm not an OPC student. Thank you. Come around the room to Bob. Bob Ellis, uh, Executive Vice President of Credit Trust. And Trey. Uh, course instructor in the College of Engineering. Second name? Morris. And uh, outstanding uh, human being and <laughs> was involved in the creativity, innovation, and change movement. Was, he was like the man behind the scenes on just basically responsible for just about everything. Simon. Simon Hooper, Learning Design and Technology Program. And I'm Kyle Peck, co-director of COIL and a professor of education in the learning, the learning Design and Technology Program, recently changed name. And that's it for me. And that brings us to our presenter uh, for the morning, uh, Eric Korb. Eric? Hi. Um, Eric Korb, uh, President and CEO of Accredit Trust. I want to thank everyone for joining us this morning and look forward to uh, presenting some of the concepts that we've been delving with for the last 12 years, as a uh, 12 months, excuse me. <laughs> Just feels uh, like Wow, that. it feels like that, sure. 
<laughs> well, we do work in dog years, right? Um, I was a former CIO of an online college of education uh, based in Indianapolis. Uh, a lot of the work that we are doing here really came from the, the demands that were brought upon us as, uh, as I was asked to start doing badging. And uh, so the outcome of that V8 moment was that uh, there needs to be another way uh, for the universities as well as other institutions to store their badges outside of their domain for continuity reasons as well as for validation. So that's what the purpose of a credit trust is to provide a global service for securely validating and curating badges uh, for, as a third party uh, service. So today, I, uh, Kyle has asked me to uh, join you and, and uh, develop a, an agenda. I've got quite a few slides and I'll move through them pretty rapidly, and, uh, but I'd be happy to take questions along the way. I do not have anything prepared, if you will. I always talk right from, from what comes out, out of my head. Um, I'm a visual person, so my slides drive my, what I want to talk about. So with that, um, I developed a, an agenda for us to, for today. Um, assume we can all accept it. what we're going to try to do is just a little bit, um, it's, it's a pleasure, by the way, not to have to explain badging. Uh, so I'm not going to have to set up a lot of uh, badging slides and explain that. But what I would like to do is um, probably show you some articles that have driven what, I, what our motivation and probably what's being motivated to you, and I, and, and I think significant things that are driving the trend of, of badging and driving this whole initiative. And so um, what, what I really think is really showing the uh, validation of the whole concept. Then what I'd like to get into a little bit about storage um, of badges, and that's really what the Credit Trust is in the end about. It's uh, storing them and holding them and making them secure is all part of the equation. You may want to call it all I call it curation. Uh, storage might be a better, uh, another word as well. Um, and then we'll look, talk a little bit about how a credit trust is trying to solve that problem, and then open discussion. But I will say, if you, anytime you want to start the open discussion on any point I make, uh, feel free to do so. Um, so we have uh, what 45 minutes or so. I've got 30 something slides. Some of them are more just visual uh, to, to start a point. But I, so I'll run through these pretty quickly. So the first thing I'd like to do is start off with, any questions up to this point? Are we okay with this agenda? All right. Yeah, we actually, we, you know, we might be able to go longer, too. Some people may need to leave, but uh, we, we, it's no hard, hard finish okay. at uh, noon. Very good. Hour at 11.30. So we're going to jump into some of the trends and things that, you know, our researchers, uh, my two colleagues who may be on the call or joining in lately, is uh, Dr. Mary Bold and Dr. Darlene Hunter who also worked with me at, the, uh, at my former college. And they became so enamored with this idea. And we're all deep in online learning and online education. Uh, they really see this as something that they, they're now going to commit uh, their, their lifelong learning now and how to deliver lifelong learning uh, achievements and, and identifying that. So they're really the, the, the people who are doing a lot of this research uh, that, we're, that we're tracking. So we're always tracking what's going on. But, this will be the only foundation slide I will do for this group. Okay? But um, I, I think what's important to understand is that we really do see badges to become a commodity. Okay? And so that means it's something you can't necessarily control. Right? So how do we make sure that we have things around badges that we can control? So you know, we started off, I don't know if it were you or me, but you know, I started off with the gold star and the piece of paper, ran home with the mom and said, look, look what I got. You know, then I peeled that star off and put it in my pocket for the next paper I got that didn't have the gold star and stuck it back on there, right? Yeah, I mean, come on. Um, but we've seen badging, you know, through the ages. I mean, it even goes back to the caveman, right? I mean, they, the guy who carried the staff and who had the headdress, that was their badge, really, right? They're the leader of the group. So that was their recognition. We always like to be recognized for what we're doing, and, and that tends to motivate us. And so 4-H Club has been doing badging. Um, the Girl Scouts for over 100 years. Um, we've now seen Xboxes. We've seen Foursquare. We're, now we have Mozilla, who is helping drive the specification. And then, so we see it going hockey stick in the areas of badges. And badges can be social. They can be academic. They could be uh, certifications. You know, they, they run the gambit. So as we move from paper to digital, uh, we see the opportunity for this to become exponential in, in growth as well as commoditization. So how are we going to control all this? So, so one of the other articles, this sort of hit us like a brick uh, back in uh, 2012, almost two years ago, well, two years ago, actually, 
And we, we saw this article that came out and really sort of in the Chronicle and talked about how you know this really poses a new way of learning, of, of challenging the traditional diploma. So I think this was a sort of the wake up call that this is coming. So nothing more to say other than I'm just going to take you through a little bit of history of articles, I think. And what you're going to notice, I, what I hope you notice is the dates, because mm -hmm. the dates start to get faster, okay? And that means that there's more topics that are happening. So, you know, this came out in March of 2013, and now we see this endorsement um, of, uh, I, actually I was at a, an event this past summer, Robert uh, Kulata, who is our assist, Assistant Deputy Secretary of Education, you know, talked about this. And, and being an online college, this is a big, important thing, because that the we were under HLC rule, okay, and HLC was our accreditor, and they still very much wanted us to be able to evaluate butts and seats and time in seats. How do you do that in an online college, unless you have, you know, a, something run, some software running or a camera running, you can't really get. You know, so we had to have rigor of 120 hours of work, you know, in, in a course, and that was part of our review. And if our and so what this is hoping to do was it gave us the opportunity to appeal that process and ask our local accreditation bodies to say, wait a minute, can we do things that are more competency based? Is it really all about butts and seats? Uh, it's really about what you're learning. So uh, we, that was a significant. Uh, now we go into April, same year. We're starting to see 25 colleges starting to dabble in this whole idea. So they picked up on it, uh, that article that and. Now the idea is that we start to see, I think there was 25 attended officials, U.S. Department of State, Higher Education, Bill and Bill Linda Gates Foundation. It's all stuff that we're all in this community, we understand is happening. But you can start to see the rapid fire of things starting to happen now. Now you're starting to see, last summer, it was announced, you know, the idea of a um, competency-based transcript. And they made the claim that employer studies show that transcripts really are useless in evaluating a candidate. So what can we do uh, to change that model and perhaps badging or digital transcripts or competency-based transcript could offer uh, more insight to the candidate. And we get into um, another, uh, now we're now into January of this, just this past year, okay? And uh, now I'm sure there are many other events, but they're sort of redundant after a while, the same idea, competency-based, competency-based, what's happening there. But this was very interesting because this study that was put out, and by the way, I'd be happy to deliver any of this content. It's open, you know, um, as it relates to the study. Um, but I found this very interesting that 22% of the adults learn from people, 18 or over, uh, in the United States hold some professional certificate or license. So, that, that's up your alley, John, right? Okay. So, so it's all about trying to provide not just education. To, to, and so this was outside of education. This was just uh, certificates of professional uh, licensure or, or certification. So, again, we're starting to see more of this happening. Now watch what happens from January 17th to January 21st. Okay. This is another big report that just came out where... Uh, uh, Parchment and uh, ScriptSafe and um, uh, ETS and um, um, Pearson are all now saying, wait a minute, you know, there's an adoption of digital transcripts. Well, those of us who have been online, we've been doing trans digital transcripts for three or four years. But um, I can tell you that uh, in the people that we're talking to in this business of digital transcripts, um, one such company is is delivered five million transcripts last year, they expect that to double next year and double again. So it's just, they're seeing the percolation of this method of delivering transcripts digitally as the ultimate way to get it done, and we're saving a lot of trees at the same time, right? But, so this is another, I think, a, a very significant piece of news that says, uh, and by the way, mentioned in this article is badging is the next layer. The next, yeah, the next layer. So, um, so they're just starting to get their ideas around transcripts now with a move to badging. So um, this was the event that I attended uh, last summer at um, uh, the InstructureCon, which was uh, held by um, Instructure, the Canvas product, uh, LMS. And uh, Richard was the keynote speaker at the end of that event. And he, he basically said that he believed there were three main things that we have to do. One was is that we have to stop thinking about 
the traditional ways that people learn because people have different needs, but we have not changed the way that we schedule them. Okay, so you know the semester starts and it doesn't stop until you know until finals. But some people just don't learn that way, so we have to stop thinking about that. The second thing we have to stop thinking is start thinking about is butts and seats. Okay, we we have to, and that was back on that. He was supporting that article that was published almost a couple of months earlier from his speech. And then, how do we address learning? So that this slide was really des designed around that whole thing. And what he talked about here was really about badging. So when he put that slide up, and this was, um, let me read it to the people yeah. that are online. Um, well, it's just it's hard to see, but it says you know provides a. a it's just knowing the elements of what badges are about. Okay, he's just telling the benefits of badging. But I think the fact that you have a, a public speaker of, 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 at our nation's level uh, talking about badging and is being an evangelist for badging. This was a this was an event on LMSs. Okay, this was not a bad for him to come out and say this. I think is showing that he's trying to. And Arnie it. Duncan, the Secretary of Ed, was at the launch of the Mozilla uh, MacArthur right. partnership on open badging infrastructure. Right. So, so I'm, I'm going to bring in another factoid that I thought was just really, really interesting on the next slide. It really doesn't have much to do about what we're doing except for the idea of online and, and then the correlation between online and badging and the digital uh, certificates. And this was something that he mentioned in his speech. He says, the demand for higher education will outweigh our supply. By 2025, there will be 263 million students worldwide. Okay, and so what he said was, and this was, I'm quoting um, Richard, he said, we'd have to build four universities the size of UMass Amherst every week for the next 15 years to meet that demand. And he said, we're just, that's just not going to happen. If anything, we're seeing campuses shrink. Okay, so it's going to have to go online. There's no other, there's no other place for it to be able to be delivered. So the, what he's saying is, is that we need to embrace this idea we need to start to look at online learning. I think all of us are sort of bought into that idea, but this is a uh, this is a fact. And a lot of that growth is happening outside the United States. So if we want to participate in it, we better be online. So that that sort of ends my little conversation about uh, if we'd like to have more um, exchange about those facts and how we think that it really affects us. But I think these are things that. That Bob and myself and our team are, are looking at to say, you know, where's the adoption? Where's the adoption? Are people starting to buy into this? You know, are we? How long do we have to continue to be evangelists? You know, are we hearing big players? I had an, an investment banker talk to me the other day and said to me, "Well, who cares about this stuff?" And the first thing I said, "Well, the Secretary of Education." Uh, I mean, it, that stopped them. Okay, so being able to have them say those kinds of things, and be able to say people like McGraw Hill, to be able to say Pearson, to be able to say those things, that that's helping us um, provide uh, legitimacy in what what's going to happen. Do we want to have any conversation around that, or I think we're with you on that. Okay, okay. So what I, um, Kyle had asked me to address some of the ideas of, of storage and. So I'm going to get a little techie here. Um, so as a CIO, I get I get to do that, um, but uh, in my role of CIO. But the what I'm going to talk about a little bit here is sort of the different ways that you can store badges. And and just so you understand that um, when the credit trust first started, uh, our first product was to actually build a badging system for Canvas. Uh, that was my motivation because uh, Darlene Hunter, who now works with us. Had walked into actually rolled into my office and said, "Eric, we should be giving out badges." And just at that point, I'm like, "Well, wait a minute. You know, where are we going to store these? Where are we going to do it?" So you don't know. Canvas is a learning management system like Angel or Blackboard. Correct. Right, and it's an open source right. as well. And it, it's a, it's extensible because it allows me to use what's called LTI, which is a learning uh, technology interface, to be able to extend its its capability. So. We felt it was necessary to really understand badging by becoming an issuer or providing issuing. And then what we really care about are the badges on the back end, which are the razor and the razor blades, right? The blades are what we really care about. So by building that, we really learned a lot of the issues around badging, and, like, and that sort of became all of the research that we went into on how we developed our whole business model. 
and that's sort of how what led me to to Kyle because Kyle's in the research. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about that more. So the native application. Um, so this is a native application situation. So I'm just going to define them. Blackboard has badging in it, but how do you get the badges out? Okay. So the prop that's one of the problems. Okay. Um, the Blackboard people may not want to hear this, but we flipped from one LMS to another. All right. So and that happens at colleges. I, I would imagine that you have more than one LMS here. We're using primarily Angel, but, right. uh, but there's probably yeah, the there are pockets. Right. Yeah. So, so the problem is, is that you know content changes, systems change, but the badges can't live in those systems if those systems get uh, sunsetted or or elsewhere. The place where the badges really need to live are in the SIS, the student information system, in the case of a college, or an HR system in the case of an organization. So the fact that that Blackboard has badging is great, but how do you get it out of there? Okay, so this is what we call a walled garden. Okay, and there's a place for walled gardens, uh, K through 12. We don't necessarily want students at that level unless they have permission by parents to have an email address that lets them own a backpack somewhere else. So, so this 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 has its place, and if you're a smaller institution, maybe you only have one place that you're going to hold this data. But me. As a former CIO, I'm going, wait a minute, these things are locked up in that place, and how am I going to get them out? Okay. So, um, so this gets to sort of the idea of portability of badges, right? So how do I get them from one system to the next? Another storage capability is, for example, um, Purdue has their passport system. Okay? Anybody can download, uh, as well as Penn State has a, has a backpack as well. Uh, I just happened to pick another one just for the sake that that's my alma mater. <laughs> um, but um, Purdue has has built a system, and and they have a lot of reasons for that. Is because they have about 14 different student information systems pulling together all of their colleges, okay, and they needed to be able to exchange that data differently than what would be out of the box from a, a standard backpack. So they had a very specific need. So it makes sense. But the idea here is though is that you want to make sure that this thing. A, a independent backpack should be able to import badges without error and, and validation. And they should also be able to export badges so that they can move or uh, move into another environment. So, so having an independent backpack offer is a, is a good service, but then you're also dependent upon that service being alive and supported and, 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 more, and, and, and also the functionality within that backpack uh, becomes uh, interesting. For example, as we all know, like in with uh, Mozilla's backpack, I can create collections, I can arrange my badges, I can make some public, I can make some private. All those kinds of things are, are going to be uh, uh, put upon the the, uh, the author of, of the backpack from a technology perspective. The uh, any questions up to this point? That leads me to the last method, which is really personal storage. I mean. Uh, you can download badges. In this case, um, what you're seeing here is a badge that I've actually exported out of a backpack, and it's it's a ping file. Okay, so it, that, that's the the standard format. And uh, in this particular case, this one actually has a QR code on it. And that QR code actually, if you scan it, well, it, it, actually I can do it with my phone. Uh, scan that, it will actually take you to the landing page or the criteria page of that badge. Okay. We, we're also this is something we're experimenting with is trying to put serialization into the badges so that it's owned by a person. Matter of fact, we actually are thinking about putting a person's picture of them inside of the badge as metadata, okay, as a gift, as a glyph, so that they cannot be uh, uh, counterfeited. So, so those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. Um, and of course, this kind of badge at this point could be uploaded into any other backpack that would accept it and understands the standard that, that this is built upon. So that's, those are really the three main environments. Um, in the case of a credit trust, uh, there's, there's another piece of the equation, which is when you look at a badge, um, you look at its portability, okay, there are different methods for how a badge, and, and this is why we didn't get into it breakfast this morning, is what I call verification versus validation. Okay? So I look at the word strictly as verification of badges is really is the data properly organized. It doesn't mean it's real, it just means that it's it's machine readable. Okay. So a 
method, as we call it, they have to be able to see this baseline information and be able to read it. And, it, and the first thing we need to do is check the, the, the um, validity or the verification, excuse me, of that data. Is it truly described properly? Can I read it? Do I understand it? And so this is cryptically what it looks like. Okay, this is a JSON file, uh, which represents the assertion of a is with how the an encryption of the person who was issued. In the case of Matsoa, it's an email address. I would challenge that email addresses are not probably the best way to validate someone's identity. Um, and so we are looking at, at ways of changing that method. And the second thing is, is that it links to an image. Okay? And so if that image link is broken, the badge now can't be validated. You can verify that that link is in the proper format, but now to get to do the validation, they're very much tied together. They're almost, you know, they're almost done at the same time, if you will. But if those links die, this simple that, that badge cannot be validated. And then the last part is the actual badge JSON file itself. Again, and then lastly is, you know, how is that badge being validated? So there are two methodologies for validating a badge, uh, for, for verifying the badge itself, of its integrity. And that's either what's called a hosted badge or a signed badge. And again, these are very, uh, very tightly coupled concepts, okay, between each other. Verification and validation often get blurred because they're almost done simultaneously, okay? I can't do one without the other, right? Because the data's got to be laid out right for be verified, but in order to validate, then I have to understand how to interpret it. Okay. okay yes. So this is following. There's a standard. Okay. This is the Mozilla standard. This is right. the Mozilla standard. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, um, so, the, so the challenge here. Um, so, I ho let me just define what a hosted mm -hmm. badge is. A hosted badge is simply a badge that is sitting on a server somewhere. Okay. And so. The only way that that badge uh, can be validated is if, it's, if it can be pulled from an HTTP request or some electronic methodology. Okay. Um, a signed badge uh, is basically that same badge, but it's encrypted okay, with a public key, private key, or some other methodology. So what happens now is, is that even though that badge sits out in a public place, it can't be read without having the decryption key or the secret decoder key to be able to look at it. Okay. So, and that's the direction that a credit trust is going in. We, we will not be supporting hosted badges, per se, formats. We will always be doing encrypted. And that's probably what you're not seeing a lot right now in the industry because it's hard to do. Okay. And so we'll talk a little bit more about our solution later. So I think it's important to understand that 99% of the time you're seeing today are hosted badges. Only recent time, and John, I don't know if you've been sitting in on the calls, but only three technical calls ago at Mozilla Foundation did they start even talking about how to do signed badges. Okay. And so, so we're, we're actually jumped over that, hosted, and jumped right into doing um, signed badges. So the way that this sort of model would work of the portability, okay, and this is just an example here, is, is that, uh, and I think we all understand this, but this is really putting it into the real life case. Okay? The student um, receives the badge, okay, and they would put it up into some displayer app for it to be consumed. Um, and so uh, what you want to make sure that you do is that the displayer app has to be able to verify and validate that that badge is real. Okay? So the displayer app has the responsibility to handle all that. Okay? I, I, will, I will mention that most of the specifications today and the things that are, I'm seeing out there are not doing those validations. All they're doing is they're ver they're, they are verifying the data. They're not validating the data. Case in point, I just imported this morning a badge in my backpack. Um, just for the sake of this conversation, let me see if I can get back to my mouse here. Um, here is my backpack, and you're going to see this badge. Anybody, I don't know if you can see this too well, but um, I'll just point. You see when this badge was issued? 
January 3rd, 2014. When was it expired? December 31st, 2012. How would that badge ever get into this backpack? That means it was verified, but it wasn't validated, in my opinion. Okay, You see the difference? The, in other words, the displayer app took the badge, but it didn't care that it wasn't valid because the, ba the badge is expired. So how, why would that badge be able to be put in there if it's expired? Okay. So those are the kinds of things. So what we expect to have are, bag, are backpacks that, are, that will never display a badge that is, doesn't come up with flashing saying, this is an expired badge, or it's become revoked. I can revoke that badge from my back end, and that back badge will never, ever show up as revoked again because no one's checking it. The only way it would get checked is if I tried to import that badge somewhere else. At that point, the badge would be revoked, and hopefully the backpack is, is going to check, make that check. So those are the kinds of things that are unfortunately creating, con not controversy, but I guess uh, concern is the word, for the legitimacy of a badge. And that's what a credit trust is trying to solve. So that's just an example. Um, so in our, in our model here, um, what we expect to have happen I'm sorry, I didn't mean to move around on That's all right, we um, can handle it. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a walker. So what happens here, this badge gets put in a display wrap. Can anybody think of an example of a display wrap where this would happen? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. There you go. Facebook. Right. Yeah, Facebook, LinkedIn. Okay. So now over here on the consumer side is the uh, HR departments looking at the LinkedIn badge or, or the badge that's in LinkedIn. And now they want to bring that into their human resources system. They want to consume that badge. So what will happen is we'll have some kind of a processor here, okay? And this is your world, John's world. The processor is the proxy, okay, who is representing the institution. In the case of parchment, is the proxy for the transcript or script save or whatever. Um, so for whoever this issuer decides to use, or they may even build their own server, but that server has to be around and up and running. It could actually be a direct access into the SIS system or the HR system in that case, wherever that credential is being ca uh, cataloged. And at that point, then the issuer comes back and sends that validation, that data back to this, and now they can say, yes, it's, it, this has truly been accomplished. And the, the next round that comes into here is a deeper dive. So at the surface level, you just saw that the badge is real, and it is the person who said they are. But now what about all the metadata that's down underneath the badge, such as the outcomes that were required to get to the badge? What about the evidence that was used? What about the grade, for example, that they, that they achieved? Now we get into touchy ground, right? FERPA, and all those other things. But if it's permission-based, just like a transcript is, um, it, it's quite possible that as a value-added service, this processor would have access to this system and be able to pull back that data from the LMS or from the SIS and then deliver that those information right into or in a, or a portfolio, okay, for the evidence, right back to the consumer app, which is the HR system. That's the vision that we see um, as we go down uh, the path here. Can, can I ask a question? Sure, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look at the big picture here. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking at the um, at the recipient. Yes. And how a person is going to submit, let's call it a transcript um, of, of badges. Um, what What is the nature of, um, of, of that submission? Um, so where, is this something on... So, so are there a number of different places where people are going to be able to store their badges and then submit them to organizations? So for example, a job says, I want badge one, three, and five. That then looks at the application, searches automatically for them, and says, yes, this person meets the criteria, move on to the next step. Exactly. It's, it, the be, you, you've depicted it perfectly. It's a similar method of when, if you were applying for a job, you go on to that job portal of that of that hiring institution. You start pulling in your resume, 
you start putting your address, your phone number, all that stuff. Instead, you'll just deliver that, that application will say, well, give me your badges. Okay, and, and so and maybe all of that would be in a registry somewhere, so you don't have to keep filling out your first name and last name and all that stuff that you can get tired of typing in on every resume. Uh, I mean, as, as I've seen some things like monster.com, whatever, now you can actually give them a PDF and they read, I don't know how the heck they do it, but they read your PDF and they fill out all the forms for you that, so you don't have to type it in anymore. So that is, exact, that is what I call a consumer app. So on the consumer side, so whoever is the person who's requesting the information is responsible for providing you with that portal to deliver that information. Today's traditional model is an HR system that's asking for your resume. Okay? In the case in point in a college, um, we use ScriptSafe as our, at, 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 the, at my private, previous employer. Uh, what they would do is we'd send the student to our white label ScriptSafe website that said Amer you know, our college. And then the person would log in, they would identify themselves, we would get a verification request to us that says, is that student really that student? And then they would then pay $28 okay, to ship that sealed transcript through the ScriptSafe network, and it would land, and if, it was, and, and if that other institution receiving the, bag, I mean, the transcript was part of the ScriptSafe network, they could send it to them digitally, as opposed to sending them a sealed envelope, which is the way we used to do it, okay, and it had to be sealed, could never be opened until it got to its destination. So that's what we see going on. And that's why what you saw in, that pre, in our previous section where we talked about now all of a sudden they're starting to say digital transcripts are the way to go, and the next piece is badging. So I envision that people like ScriptSafe will have a product called BadScript, which will be a transcript of badges, which will, will just be a collection of badges that you selected and giving them authorization to deliver for you the as a promise. The difference here is that your badges can come from a number of different places, right. Right? whereas a transcript is from one institution, one transcript. And you paid that $28 to everyone that they wanted to see. Right. right. As yeah. opposed to here, you'll be able to create a collection first, call that a document, and then again, with verification, then the, the so the displayer, that, the way I understand it, and I'm just learning about their plans as well, mm -hmm. is that the displayer that would be part of that Transmission yeah. would actually check each of those badges and, and validate that they are what they say they are, no matter where they came from. Right within that system. Exactly. So, um, so that that's how we see this whole mechanism or ecosystem starting to happen. And then there's the second layer where you start to see things like endorsements. And I'm going to show an example later on that. So, so we're now into sort of, we're actually teed up perfectly for what we're going to talk about, which is the solution, which, uh, which we're proposing. And by, by no means do we believe that we've got the only answer, okay? We expect there'll probably be thousands of technologies out there in, in, over time. We, we just feel that we're right now very much on the early stage of the opportunity, and we're sitting at tables with people who can make movement uh, in this space. And so we have an opportunity, and we're going to try to seize that opportunity for our company and to hopefully establish what we think is a little bit more of an open, not an open spec, but a more a practical way of delivering the badges. So does anybody know who said this? <coughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, that was by uh, Kyle. So this is what gave me my, yeah, my um, aha moment, as a matter of fact. If, uh, and this became really a big, this is pasted all over our, our, our office, okay, <laughs> this is this statement. Because this is what we're really trying to become. And, and it made so much sense when I read it. And this was a back and forth between, I think, uh, Jonathan Finkelstein at Credly and you and a few other on a, on a user group um, on Google about the whole idea. And some people were saying, why would anybody build their own backpack? And then another person was saying, well, you know, Jonathan was coming in like, well, you know, they go up and they go down, and you know, there's what they call pop-ups, where which are like events that just happen for a period of time, and then the institution, as well as the the event, goes away, right? So where, where's that thing going to get stored? And then somewhere down the bottom of this, you you chime in with this big long dissertation, but this is what, what we gleaned, and I, I said um, I spent. By the way, I did not contact Kyle for almost eight months from when the time I read this because I wanted to make sure. I could prove it to him that I built it before I actually came to him. But 
I was quite happy to see that that I think it totally makes sense, and um, and everybody that we talk to also agrees with you. When I when I first heard about badges, I kind of assumed that that was part of what the Mozilla infrastructure would do. It would be a repository. Everybody who's awarded a badge, boom, the metadata would be there. Now I knew the links out to evidence were probably the evidence itself, the videos and everything probably weren't going to be hosted. But I thought that everything, every badge that was issued would live somewhere. So you would be able to always, re, re, you know, pull them back. You know, leaving anything in my hands is questionable. <laughs> you know, or my computer is questionable. Right. Especially since these water bottles don't stand up straight. Right, right. Uh, but I thought, so, well, great. And at any time, I can just say, bring me all my badges. And, uh, but, but that wasn't happening. So that's kind of what led to that. It's like, well, gee, if this is really going to be important and change the way people learn and describe learning, then... You know, and it's a big national, international movement. Shouldn't there be a... And so... So thank you for that quote. Um, so what I want to do is take you back in time a little bit. This was about December of um, last year. Yeah, last year. Um, not last year, the year before. So it was in 2012. Um, when uh, Darlene had come to me and said, Eric, um, I'm using Credly to issue badges. And this is a great thing. And you should be doing this. This is me as a CIO of an online college. I'm like, going, wait a minute, stop. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, we're an accredited institution. Uh, we need to have a badge policy. We need to understand what the badges are. You know, what's our integrity? What are the outcomes? And, and, my, and of course, my counterpart, uh, uh, Dr. Bold, the dean of our college, who is also a partner at, at the Credit Trust now, um, I immediately had a phone call to her, and, and actually she started laying out all these things on this page. I'm like, okay, Corb, you know, who, we got to get college buy-in. We need academic integrity. You know, how do we avoid badge inflation? So all the things that a dean, you know, immediately wakes up and says, wait a minute, hold the presses. So, so part of our uh, another arm of our co of our school, uh, excuse me, of our company is a whole um, consulting arm that's working with colleges to help them develop, or any institution, these basic things. We believe that you shouldn't really get into badging until you get a badge policy. So I get criticized a, a, a lot. I, I'm taught, I always use the word badging is not a game. Okay? Uh, and, and we really need to think about the, what we call serious badgers, if you will. And, um, and and I get criticized for using that because listen, you know the social badges are just important to that brownie who got that badge on her sash as it is to the, the academic who issues the badge to someone who graduated class. But what we're looking at are things that become actual equity for someone in in the professional world. Um, but certainly we want to see social badging continue. Uh, but I don't know how much participation we will have in that space, although we believe the integrity should be there and they should not be forged just like any other badge. So we hope that they still accept our, our method. So these are the things that um, we often ask a college, uh, or we, most of our work right now has been with higher ed and, and high schools. And they look at us like we're crazy. They go, well, we just want to issue badges. <laughs> you know, like, we just want to keep the tires is basically what they're saying. We're like, well, you're really not sure you really want to do this, and then they go away mad, okay? But I'm rather than go away mad and then have them come back later, and understand that this, is, you know, if we're going to be a steward in this industry of badging, we have to hold that standard, and we want we we're trying to force this, unfortunately, on maybe too early on some of our our uh, our tire kickers, but it's very important. And John, this will be for you too. You know, you really got to sit there with your with those uh, people and decide all about this because badge inflation will end up just like great inflation. Okay? Everybody passes the course. So, any questions about these? Yeah, sure. Real quick, uh, from the web, we have sure. a question from uh, Stephen Schaefer uh, about the uh, verification of validation of the badge, so asking, couldn't it be handled kind of like Bitcoin is through a uh, blockchain <laughs> public database? Yeah, so um, we actually yeah. thought about delivering our technology on a Bitcoin. Uh, that was one of the first uh, for platforms. <laughs> yeah. um, so yes, the answer is yes. A Bitcoin protocol, which most people don't realize it's a protocol, it's not just a, a, a currency. So, um, and we often, and originally I thought of badges as coins, and that's why I investigated that, but the model uh, fell down quite quickly when you could find out that if you don't have enough miners 
in your in your uh, world of Bitcoin, uh, you can be get denial of service attacks on our, and we could lose control of our own badges. And then the tariff to be able to get them back and into our miners. Miners are people who mine coins in Bitcoin. Um, so we'd have to build a very very big uh, minefield of our own in order to control the badges. And by the way, there's a czar who's in part of the whole Bitcoin who can decide what the tariff is on those coins. So we, if they wanted to, they could actually make the transaction fee higher than what the actual badge is worth at some point. And we did not want to be in a position where we could not control the, the, the value of a coin. So, but you're dead on with the concept, um, but from a technology and a, a control perspective, uh, we felt it would be difficult to walk into Penn State and say, we're putting your badges on the Bitcoin chain. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, so uh, that might be proven wrong over time as, as the confidence of that network works. Uh, but we, we really didn't want to get a Napster event going on with, with, uh, with Bitcoin, as Bitcoin is sort of like a Napster environment. Other questions? Trey has yeah. a question. Yeah, sure. so uh, I teach a class this semester and we use exclusively badges to be brave. And I'm not familiar with the Penn State policy on badges. So mm -hmm. what would be there isn't one. No, okay. But <laughs> right. so so you're flying yeah. under the radar right now. Right. So yeah. you're still giving grades and transcripts. I mean your grades have been going transcripts. Sure. Sure. Okay. Right. 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 Well that that happens. So so one of the things that happens is uh, competency based learning models tend to follow with badging. And and I run a course too and I give badges, but I also it ends up as a grade. It ends up as you said, everybody who gets all the badges gets an A in the course because they've managed everything. Ting, Ting Tao was one of our, our students who uh, who was in that class last year, and the class is running now. But the badge doesn't say it's, well, it kind of does now say it's a Penn State badge. It's, I'm going to use the badging, Penn State badging system this time. Yeah. The badge is Hang Tower and said, this is issued by Kyle, Dr. Kyle Peck, a professor at Penn State, rather than by Penn State University. And ultimately, I think the university will ultimately, probably relatively soon, have a policy and how badges get approved. But uh, they do for certificates and new programs and new courses. Even to get a course on the books has to go through an approval process. Mm -hmm. So we decided to build the uh, build the engine first. You know, have some examples, uh, do some things that are that are not uh, too flimsy, mm -hmm. so there would be examples that they can see that of how it might have value and how initially it would run in parallel with the existing grading systems. Right. Ultimately, I think the existing grading systems will pass away and the badging will be uh, will be the only thing left. But that, that could be decades away. Yep. Any other questions? So, sure. uh, yeah, when you, when you said, I saw your bullet on badge inflation. That's mm -hmm. not at all where I thought you were going to go with that. Okay. Um, rather than like the, the grade inflation, I was thinking more of like, there's so many badges out there. You know, if we start to badge things at a really low granular level, like every week of every class, that's that's that's, that's badges. Thousands like, of badges. No, that's that, that's and, what I meant. It may not be what I said. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, and I, but I did think that that was a really interesting. Mm -hmm. That there are two kind of inflation right. points. That yeah. one is, you know, just by default, like being in the class, everybody just gets the badge, so it right. makes them. Less meaningful. But participatory. Yeah. But yeah. think of the badge like a nested doll. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what right. you end up with is as yeah. the sum total. And, and that's really, you know, the event that, that passes through the protocol really is the sum total. Right. So it's, it's okay is that it's as granular as long as the one mm -hmm. is only significant. But and there aren't yeah, two, I'm, I'm, two match badges for the same outcome. That right. Event. That's, I mean, that's a, a much more familiar uh, discussion where. When I've talked with other faculty here, they say, well, you know, isn't that too many? Isn't that overwhelming for an employer? And you know, I, I, the answer that I've given is just what you said, that well, you take a bunch of classes, that sums up three. Uh, so in, in that sense, but I haven't really I thought really about it. I like the, the nested dog. Yeah, thing. We've been talking about meta badges, which are badges yeah, that contain other badges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But cool. the ability to, to drill down within a badge, and, and the way our system is, when you can create you create steps to earning a badge, and a, a previous badge can be a step to earn a badge. But the nested doll thing going inside and going inside. One of the things I, I'm, I still I defend lots of badges uh, because you have that way you have the evidence and the criteria from each of those steps. And in some jobs, I, I talked to a guy when I was at UCF this week. He, all he does is front-end analysis for the Navy, right? 
So he has an instructional design degree. That means a lot of things. And task analysis, you know, this front end analysis is one thing that, you know, may get in a program little attention. And yet here he makes a living for that. And, uh, you know, the Navy uses that. Then they, then they pass off to everybody else, you know, what they need to build. So these, there's, so anyway, I think there's, I can still make a good case for all of that. Uh, so I, I, I see that my colleague, Dr. Bold, is there. She's now cringing that I'm ask, asking her to raise her hand. But uh, we had an experience yesterday, and maybe she could share with you, about a high school that had 53 assignments, okay? And we were hoping they weren't going to put a badge on every assignment. But then again, it's high school. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, Mary, would you, uh, can you, uh, would you like to chime in and join our conversation? Is we that, hear you, yes. Mary? Sorry, she Maybe she's trying to get her mic. I out. heard. Uh, she may have stepped away too. I don't know if she's there. But we'll, we'll, if she if she uh, she comes in, we'll let her. Uh, While we're waiting, we yeah. do have a question from sure. uh, another one of the uh, coil directors. Uh, Larry Reagan has a has a question. Larry, are you live? Yes. Can you uh, hear me? Okay. That Perfectly. Great. Perfect. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Uh, very interesting conversations and. Um, as you may have figured out, Kyle's got a lot of us at Penn State interested in the uh, idea of badging. Um, I, I run a leadership institute in the summer here, and sort of at the last moment last summer, we put uh, badging on with the help of Chris and Kyle. I badged the program, and um, I, I was not expecting too much, frankly. Uh, sometimes our participants do all of the assignments. Sometimes they don't. Uh, however, this time, once I put the badging onto the course assignments, I saw this e immediate increase in activity. It, it stunned me. And when I when we gathered together in State College, I asked them why was that, and they say, "Well, you know, we wanted the badge." So they clearly valued that that badge. Uh, it really had no other authority or validation behind it. And my question is, how do I? Um, so, so we went through each of the items or the assignments in the particular course, but um, I, I think in sometimes I got too granular and at some points they were too broad. Finding that sort of sweet spot, do you have any sense like the criteria, like this, this class you're talking about, this high school class having 56 assignments and badging every one of them? How, how do we as um, badge creators, how do we decide which piece of this is worthy? Well, I'd really like to defer that to Dr. Bold because she, that's her domain expertise. But I, I would say that in conversations where I've participated with her, I, 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 the answer typically is we, we have to, we're educators, so we have to make those decisions, uh, and we have to we have to let them learn the way they want to learn. Um, but I think the 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 idea there, there though is that we don't want to get to a point where it's just the sake of having a badge. So. If there's an outcome, there is a criteria for re, for which you're getting that badge. I think it's it's fine to do that, but if it's just for the sake of a badge, um, it, it, what we call incremental, okay? So those are what we call incremental kind of badges, where they just are they building up to something, and then essentially those let's just say of all those 53 badges, if they were to happen to give all them out. Um, they really are going to get a course badge at the end of the day. So maybe those 53 of them are throwaways. They're just stepping stones to the, to the bigger badge. So I think you might want to look at it that way. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question. I think, uh, I don't know, if, like I said, if Mary's around, she could chime in. But uh, I would encourage you to, to maybe reach out for us uh, and, we can, and have Mary speak with you one-on-one. -on -one. And talk to you a little bit more about that. But that's that's the area that she's been driving in our company. Uh, Mary just raised her hand online. Mary, do you have a do you have a microphone? So I can't up at the yeah, she, she, No, she we use Adobe oh, Connect, okay. so she's she's familiar with the tool. Um, so Mary, if if you could, are you on mute or? Oh, she's off mute now. I don't know if she's speaking. Well, we'll let her try to chime in. Um, she's there's gonna, a, there's yeah. an audio control panel. If you go up to uh, the meeting menu, I think you can set your which microphone. It may be thinking you have two microphones and it's on the wrong one or something. Yeah. 
So if you go to audio setup wizard under the meeting menu, you might be able to fix that problem. Okay. So one of the things that, that um, I, but I wanted to touch on the point that you made um, on the, the, call, the call in question was that uh, we see another institution who was actually considering using badging for first year experienced students in the college and actually to see if retention could be made at that level. And if we could, pr if we could start to see a freshman class, if you will, all engaged in, in badging, and if that correlated to a richer experience, more motivation, and to stay in college, you will see fast adoption at the, at the university level yeah. because you're talking about tuition now. Okay? So if we can keep them engaged, here's Mary. My system is being resistant. Sorry, Eric's point is well made. Oh, thanks, Mary. Um, so uh, uh, anyway, thank you, Mary. Um, We've all been there, Mary. Yeah, and Mary is an expert in this system, right. so I, I swear she is doing everything she can to get it going. Uh, she's very technical. Um, what I was going to say was is that if we could get a college or a department or program to look at freshman first year experience student and yeah. and look at that and then be able to go back into the bursar's office and say how many of these guys resigned this this term and how are we starting to see an uptick uh, you'll you'll see a tremendous adoption of badging and I think we would love to see that happen at an academic level. Yes. And actually that's what we're doing right now as a freshman seminar class. In okay. Engineering we're trying to track is their Mary just jumped out of her seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, we're trying to teach them skills that engineers should know and don't yes. get to know yes. uh, so much later in their careers. So we're trying to make sure that they don't drop out is the big thing go to ISD or some other right. college. So if you can provide that kind of data, yeah. I mean I, I think it I think it's Wall Street Journal level kind of conversation. I mean, they would, if you could drive retention and have people, I mean, because that's the biggest thing that as, a, as an officer of the college that I was driven on, why we moved to a different LMS, why you build the gymnasiums, right? Because you want to keep those students here, right? Well, um, the, 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 in this example. If you could drive it at the education level, wow. In this example, giving the students uh, a, the Believe that they have greater control over the landscape that they see in front of them, uh, you know, to qualify their outcomes, to get to, to meet their goals, and it really leads a pathway. And, and so, if they take greater ownership, there's greater loyalty in general terms, which is pretty much what you just articulated. Um, I I think that that's what's so important about badging. That's what all of us, that, you know, in, in different areas of business and education, um, are sort of coming to. That we know that it'll empower individuals to see their personal landscape starting to pull out in front of them. And it's going to give them some type of pathway, a roadway that they don't always see. Um, in our lifetime learning, we don't we know where we're going, we know where we'd like to go, but we don't always see a total pathway. And this gives a tremendous viewpoint for the individual. It's and instant and, feedback. And the, and, the, and the university, in this instance, that gives them the tools to give them greater insight into their pathway is going to retain those. It also and helps it because it forces us to, to define what we care about. Right. And to uh, you know specify that to students. And often, if you tell them what you really care about, they'll get there. And that synthesization and clarification will become more and more acute as you, as, as the badging protocol refines itself over time. All right. Okay. So I think the next slide um, I'm getting to is um, this was what I was faced with. So I was referred to Mary and me as the yin and the yang. Okay, at, at, at the college. Uh, so she was driving the academic issues. I was driving the the, um, the, uh, the technology issues, and um, this was really what set me on my first research, which was about January of, of the last year. Which was you know, well, what technology is there? I didn't even know about Mozilla or what was going on there. Um, I, that's why I started searching and, and, and finding what was out there. You know, number one, could our how would we even issue badges in our LMS? Was the question. I mean. Canvas, I knew, was a pretty robust environment, but they didn't have badging. Um, how we were going to, and I didn't really like, I wasn't comfortable with the idea of using a third party system outside because now that's one more system I've got to manage. And I also have to provide access and authentication um, 
when you can go on a third party badging system and just say who you say you are and now all of a sudden you're you're now a representative of the of the institution without any authority uh, got me very nervous okay so um, you know so it didn't be it didn't meet my litmus test for selecting a third party vendor that didn't let me provide the authentication of the people who are going to be issuing badges okay so I, I would I would raise that level of, of uh, consciousness to any of the people who are thinking about issuing of creating third party badging systems um, the second piece was you know how I was going to manage it right do I have people involved in it? anybody even understood it you know, I was still trying to get my arms around it um, you know and where am I going to store this in my SIS okay we were using campus uh, view um, there was no there's only places for grades there's no places for badges you know so how am I going to hold on to this data and then of course the FERPA concerns which which I didn't know whether there were or were not um, but it, it certainly was an issue and continuity and this is really you know where I feel it was a big value proposition for a credit trust in the end of the day and then the, the whole idea of forgery okay um, there's something there's some questions I see coming so okay I'm just going to keep on going so, so these were the things that I was starting to look at, and so, so the research found that um, this was after about three months of work, uh, you know, of me playing and and, and, and by the way, at my college, um, I was uh, the first CIO of the college. I had a staff of four representing over 4,000, you know, matriculating students. So I did had to do all my own research. I had to do all my own coding. I had to do a lot of my own sort of heavy lifting. So. This I can only do this at a certain pace. So, as much as I put a thwart on it, I had to stop it until we could figure it out. So we uh, we found that Canvas actually was extensible enough, or or I could build on top of the LTI integration and with their API, which was very rich, be able to issue badges through a, a, our own developed application. So um, I commissioned out of my own pocket. Um, a, a development of a third-party badging system to run inside of Canvas, and that's what's known as Badge Safe for Canvas today. And that's was the razor that we built. Okay, but then I so I knew that I could build on a standard, so I, I built the system to build open badges uh, using their specification. I knew I could build some code to actually make Canvas issue a badge when when the um, when the when they reached a certain outcome. And but the problem still existed was where am I going to store these darn things? Okay, so the big question mark was where's the third party storage? Where's the retrieval? Where's the endorsement? Where's the validation? And that's when I came across Kyle's quote, and he said it doesn't exist. Okay, and that's when I got the V8 moment. Like okay, so we, so we, let's go build it. So um, so we started studying the badge, and so this got. So after we got through the idea of issuing badges, we started looking at all the anatomy of a badge. And, and these are the things that we really started to look at that are the cornerstones of our of what we have been preaching around the country around badging. And we, we, I think what we undersell is the whole idea of marketability. Okay? The whole idea of a badge, I showed an example earlier. I'll bring it up again to, all right now, but um, if you... A badge has, every badge has a landing page, as we all know, right? And if that landing page is not available, the badge is useless, okay? So in this case, you know, for some reason, ace.edu, which is not a domain that I manage anymore, has stopped, ceased to deliver this badge. And so uh, anybody who ever received the badge through ace now is not being validated. Um, but we could also do a badge, for example, this is one that I now is moved over to a credit trust network. And here we have a badge that actually can be validated. But you notice that there's a little access key here. Okay. So in this situation, I want to see more data than that's available in the standardization of the badge, right? I want to see more data. So someone could then purchase an access key, okay, to be able to allow the third party, the consumer, to see this, so I could ship off my little key, and now you can see the data that's actually being pulled right out of Canvas, which is the mastery level, which was a score of five. Okay? Um, I mastered the outcome. Um, it told me, it gave me my student ID, okay, so that if someone, the HR person, wanted to go call the registrar or somehow electronically 
confirm, is that student ID match up with Eric Corb? Yes, it does. Okay, so let's start to do some validation, more secondary validation. There's the course ID that I actually took, okay? There's the actual instructor ID that's embedded into Canvas so that we can identify the instructor if we need to. So all this is that rich data that is protected by FERPA, but by offering a key to get access to it, we can extend the metadata that's in that bag. Well, it, it will be more rich when you bring out, instead of the instructor ID, you bring out that person's yeah, okay. profile page and right. the, you know, right. and the course ID turns into the course syllabus, uh, or at least course description in the catalog. Exactly. So another example of a badge, and we're getting into marketability, is here's one with an example. This is a, this is a mock-up. The, the badge itself is real, and so is the criteria description. But what's not real is the, is the advertisement below. And so what you're seeing here is, is that an opportunity that for every landing page is an opportunity to display additional information around that badge. <coughs> so in the case in point here, we've got the badge. But below it says, those who have earned this badge are also enrolled in this course. So the opportunity here is to provide marketing, brand as well uh, for the issuer of the badge. So as I display my badges publicly and I click through them, I land on these criteria pages, if you're not advertising or delivering some way of another message, you're losing out on a, and this is a marketer's dream. I mean, if you showed this in the marketing department, I will tell you there are colleges right now issuing badges only for the reason of this. Okay, they want, they want to issue MOOCs as advertisements, as getting a sample of our courseware, they give you a badge, and then you land here, and they hopefully capture you. We take our online course at. Okay. Right. Okay. So these, so every student becomes an advertiser for you. Okay. So back to the, um, to the slide. Um, so, so what's important here that we learn quickly is the things on the right, uh, which are what we call what's linked to the badge. That's that the core the definition is that the only thing that's really in there is the ID, the recipient, when it's issued. All the rest are reference URLs. And if those URLs go down or are not available, the badge becomes valueless. So how do we provide a service that allows that to happen? So we see that the, from a technological point of view, and all social, at a social level, the challenges to adoption is we need to in, in, involve trust. Okay? The only way you're going to get trust is to make sure that there's availability and there's validation. Not verification, validation. Verification of data. Anybody can hack up a, a, a fake badge and, and make it look constructively correct. I mean, I think one of our people made uh, that. Ken Lang did a President of the United States badge that said he was President of the United States. Right. Okay. As an so, example of how it could be fixed. So he built, a, he built a valid, uh, I mean, a, a verifiable data model, but not a validated data, okay? Obviously, he's not the president. So the other issue, yeah, the other issue, yes, <laughs> is, the, is the communication between systems. So uh, we want to make sure that we have interoperability between systems. And this is now getting more closer to the things that we're developing in our, in our labs and to be able to have data work between each other. And then lastly is the linking of badges, <coughs> stackable badges or endorsement badges. Or, where a badge will become more valuable as more things get put on top of it or associated with it. So how? Do, so this is just an example of really the a big problem, okay? Um, and 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 that is not being addressed currently by the current Mozilla uh, this data is model. One that you may not have. Right. So this slide is not. Uh, it, uh, this is only for our audience um, because this is getting into some of our proprietary stuff. But what what we're showing here is, does everybody see the problem? Okay, I mean, you have three different stakeholders that represent their constituents differently. When I'm an issuer, it's maybe, a, it's a UID, but it's still one, two, three, four. If I'm an endorser, which means like maybe I'm a member of an association, I, I, in my database, I represent them as member. It's still the same person, it's one, two, three, four. And in the case of the endorser database, they may, put their data for, for expire database by, you know, year, month, I'm sorry, um, month, day, year, but yet the issuer system has it in month, day, year, okay? But in the consumer system, they're using, a, uh, you know, an alpha and a numeric. So how... 
So, so this is this is where we really think our mo model and the model, John, that we're using also solves the problem of language. Okay, because if you can define these things not only machine to machine, you can also allow them to translate from language to language. Okay. So when we look at this, um, I don't know if this is one of the slides as well, but um, uh, again, nothing super proprietary here, but this is sort of the, the, the entire value chain, if you will. Can we point we, a camera at that for sure, our external yeah, viewers? And sure. if you want us to cut it later, we can cut That's it fine. from there. Um, so th this is what we call the, the value chain or the, or the chain of, of trust. And so as, as a company, we, need, we felt that these are the big, big buckets, you know, from, of the ecosystem that we need to address. So if we start with the institution, okay, uh, that's the person who's the issuer, okay. Then we need to be able to associate those with the recipient. And then we need to make sure that there's authorization between those parties that they both are, have a, re and that we can uh, essentially say, yes, now is it authorization, but on top of that, that means there's a relationship but we also need to have security, right? So that's because you're authorized doesn't mean you have access, okay? And then, then there's the achievement itself. And on top of that is the evidence of the achievement. Then we move over to the endorsements, which add value on top of the achievement. And then we have to, all the chain behind has to be validated, not verified, okay? It can't be verified, it can't be validated unless it can be verified. So again, remember that they're very much locked together, okay? And then we also have to make sure all that's portable. How do we move from system to system to system? So these are the boxes that we are, uh, some of them we are deep in, some of them we are, are not. Uh, we don't expect to be an institution, but we want to influence the institution on understanding this chain of trust that has to happen. So uh, this is not a, a slide that's on, this, on the system, but this is meant to, to scare you, I'm part, I'm purposely. Uh, what do you need to do to get this to happen? Okay, this is this is the CTO and me. Um, so we need to have a carrier class system. Okay, this thing has to be up 24/7. Okay, has to have nine 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 four nines after the dot. Okay, uptime. Uh, it has to be able to be driven by a glossary. Okay, we need to have validation. We need to have public key infrastructures. We need to be able to provide the portfolio, facilitate third-party endorsements, all these things. So John, don't develop it, we're doing it. Okay. So um, th this is what, what, we're, what we believe is the value proposition we're bringing to the table. So our unique selling proposition, and we're just moving on to the next slide, is we want to provide a centralized repository that can be uh, verified even if the issuing system or service organization ceases to respond. And this is essentially what I believe is the answer to what Kyle was saying in his, in his question. Okay. And so if we, if we delete, deliver the, on this promise, uh, we believe we're, we're bringing the value to the industry. Secondly is what's the value? So the value is, is, is it has to be unprecedented convenience. It has to be as if it doesn't even there. It's just like you go into a credit card uh, and, and you swipe your card, okay? You don't really care how that transaction happens. You just want to make sure that your card is valid and no one's, and, and then they're also protecting you in case someone stole it, right? Uh, but you want to make sure that that transaction happens because at that point of sale, you want to buy that good, okay? How many times have you bitten at that point of sale when they said, well, right now the system's down, I can't buy, well, I have no cash on me. So we have to make it extremely easy and make it extensible and make it available for our, our users and our, our constituents to use it. So what, how we are plan to do that is uh, we're going to build a, um, an API okay, that is simple to implement. It's going to be based on standards. We're calling our product badge safe. Okay? We're very much using metaphors that are around banking, okay? credit trust, repository, like a, like you say, it's a deposit box. So we, we, we're setting up our company as very much under the standards of what you would consider. You trust us with your money. You, you, trust, you trust us with your badges like you would trust us with your money. Um, we, we, wanted, we were built on top of a transactional system that's based on, on payment gateway. 
so that we will be able to handle millions of transactions when they occur. And we're building the mo that model so that they, we can extend this into other areas besides just education, because education will have its own set of specs, and, in, and other industries will have their mm -hmm. others. But we still want to make sure that they can communicate with each other. And then lastly, on the bottom is, is that like a VeriSign has that check mark, okay, or Norton has a check mark. Or we we will that will be our sign on the door that says this is badge safe verified. So when you walk into that retail location and it says we accept Visa, we want that mark to be on all of our partners' uh, still, uh, badges. So we see you know a very this may not be a slide that's up there. Um, but you can certainly take a look at it. Uh, this is where we see the robust ecosystem. Uh, there's a huge network effect here uh, where you have people who may just be doing validation through our network. There might be other third-party validators. They're just using our API to perform those, those, um, the, the, those activities. There will be all kinds of displayer apps, whether it be LinkedIn, PeopleSoft. Um, there will be endorsers that are government institutions, or they could be .orgs or professional organizations like John represents. And then, of course, there will be multiple backpacks. Okay? We'll offer a white label one, but you will be able to build your own backpack with our own API. Okay? And then lastly, there's, of course, the, the issuer side, which is the, all the, the push of data. So um, this document, uh, this uh, image, again, I, I don't know if it's in the, um, the other system, but um, this is an example of how it would be implemented. Okay? You will have integrating partners. So our, our whole idea is to put uh, people like John's company in the business of badging without having to make that infrastructure investment. And what they would do is integrate into his current applications or build into their system the ability to actually build secure API and metadata and build, build badges for themselves through, through the system. Um, the areas that we see are prime for adoption. We have issuers, we've got consumers. So on the issuer side today, we, we're seeing education, obviously. But we also see a very strong area in workforce. And that's what I was saying earlier, John, that we really believe that the, you know, these are the areas that are, are ripe you know, for service industry, transportation. There's 1.2 million truck drivers out there, every one of, of independent drivers. Okay? They have to get validated every time they get hired, whether they can carry tandems, they can explosives, fuel, all that. Every time they get hired, a background check has to be done. There's a complete inefficiency in the market of, of how they could be validated. If they could be sold a badge that's good for 30 days, for example. For example, in the pharmaceutical industry, one-third of a work week of, a, of your typical sales representative is spent on, on learning online in some way, uh, and then quizzing out against uh, you know, Viagra's next marketing protocol. If they cannot go into the market, uh, and that would be a perfect example of that. You're going to need to get these 10 badges over the next 12 months and also be on your OSHA certification. Here's the, here are the badges that are, that are transparent. They all need to become solid. And you now are tasked with making sure you stay in line with that. There's their landscape. There's their mission. Um, and then they'll take the tests and very, become very easy for their managers, which is daunting for them now, to make sure that their salespeople in the field are staying at task and in turn with the information. Okay, because then they're also day job, not just being you know, an overseer for education. So it's a very compelling uh, conversation that we're having in that industry right now. Um, and I see that really catching fire with other industries. But they are going crazy to have it immediately. What they would really like to do is partner with a major university to test it. So um, I'd like to conclude um, with, uh, with basically a real world, what I see as a real world example. Um, and uh, my wife is a nurse practitioner, so uh, that's not her, but uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, she went to Seton Hall, okay, which is a very prominent uh, nursing college in, in the United States. And she went through the Accelerate program, very uh, I'm jealous of her how quickly she learns. But um, what I want to do is sort of take you through what, I could, what we see is how this all will come together. And um, so uh, what we see here is like the nursing credential ecosystem, if you will. And I'm going to use the example of New Jersey because I'm familiar with this process personally. So when, so when Susan uh, got out of, 
at a nursing uh, school. She's actually a nurse practitioner, so she has a, actually two levels of nursing on top of just a standard RN. And she's also in pediatrics, so she has a specialty. And that also allows her to dis administer drugs, okay, and, and prescribe drugs at that level. So when, when she first got out of school, I was so happy because I didn't have to pay anymore. <laughs> uh, but uh, because she did it while we were, uh, after we had gotten married. And um, she, we sat with like 30 FedEx boxes in front of us, packing her transcripts in there so that she could start applying to different places for employment. And then part of that was also for her to go to the state of New Jersey, which administers her, uh, her test, which will give her 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 license to practice as a nurse. So at that point, uh, she then, by the way, that test is then administered by another third party, which happens to be a subsidiary of EPS, and they actually administer the exam. And then that exam then gets sent back to the Consumer Affairs Department. They say that she's passed that test, and now she gets her health certificate. Well, then, lo and behold, she's got to take those two things and send it off to CNA, which is her malpractice insurance provider, which is the number one malpractice provider for, for nurses and doctors. And now she, so that, all that stuff had to be shipped off in sealed envelopes and everything and prove out, and then they had to do their background checks and do all that kind of stuff to make sure that Susan is who she says she is. And then all that stuff had to be imported into the hospital that she was working at, which happens to be a workday system. Okay, And then she also had to be fingerprinted. Every person who works in a hospital in New Jersey has to be fingerprinted, so then they can, every time she goes through a portal, she gets fingerprinted, okay? And then, uh, lastly, she does work in a private practice now, so as a parent who would bring their child to a new, is new in town, and they want to check out what is the best practice in the area, they would want to be able to validate that Susan knows what she's talking about and has all of her credentials, and there's a confidence that could be built before they bring that young child for the first time to see the pediatric nurse. So in our world, she gets the badge from the assessment of, of the Seton Hall. That badge gets shipped off to Consumer Affairs Department, validated machine to machine. That then, she takes the exam online. Okay, Somehow she validates her fingerprint that she's the person taking the exam. That badge now gets shipped off to the to the Consumer Affairs, an endorsement badge is created. It says, yes, we endorse now her badge, and then she has her credential. Those two badges get shipped off to CNA, and machine to machine validate that it's real. And then they get imported into Workday through the import function. Okay? Now what can happen is the expiration date of her license, of her now practice insurance, could now be checked within the Workday system automatically. Okay. In addition, if Susan were to go out and not can have her continuing ed credits that she has to continue to do, the New Jersey could, about, could say, wait a minute, you're, you're two months away from, you better get those credits, as well as the HR department might send her an email saying, guess what, Susan, in two weeks, if you don't get these credits, you're out of here. And if she were to fail to do that, CNA could basically then check to see if she did do, do that on her badge and say that it has not been updated, the metadata has not been enriched, or a new badge has been issued, and we're now pulling your malpractice insurance, which could send an alert back to Workday to say, guess what, don't let her in the building, because she's a risk. So that's where we see the ecosystem happening, and that's where I see the, the opportunity. Will it happen tomorrow? No. We need a lot of adoption to make that all happen, but it has to start somewhere. And so we're talking to what we believe are some of the constituents who could make this happen. And if we can, I think we're on to what I consider a, a lot more efficiencies in the market, a lot more efficient way for people to be uh, brought into the workforce and for them to continue to get educated at, over time. And all the players, all the stakeholders have an opportunity to benefit from the metadata that are in those badges. With that, that concludes my presentation. I think before we, uh, but I need to do a bathroom break. So okay, down the hall and yeah. down the hall in the middle there by the elevator. Take a left and a right. One of the things I'll I'll uh, take the opportunity to discuss right now is at breakfast we were talking about and maybe Bob can pick up the conversation here. We we're talking about their concept of endorsement, endorsing a badge. So 
one of the things I read last week was a, a, an article about 16 Western universities that looked at their looked at the problem students have in getting courses approved, you know, from institution to institution, like gen ed courses, things like that. They looked at their gen ed courses and had six had uh, developed competencies within those gen eds that are going to be transferred instead of courses. So if you think about the the, the problem people have in transferring courses, if badges become uh, chunks of courses, it becomes easier to see whether courses can be transferred or not. And then again, if I have four of those five or six badges in the course, maybe I don't have to take the whole three credit course. I can just, you know, clean up those last two. So there's that. But they're talking about endorsement in terms of um, think it, think now about a professional association, AERA, for example, putting its endorsement on top of qualitative learning. You know, badges that we have, like a case study methodology, qualitative badge, you know, phenomenology, or, or whatever. And so then, like the AERA could endorse Penn State's badges, could endorse other people's badges, could put out the requirements for badges. I mean, so then AERA might endorse it. You know, AEA, AECT might endorse our instructional design badges. So might ISTE. And so these endorsements become other things that you can add to badges. I just sort of introduced the idea of endorsements. Bob, yeah. did you, you might be prepared to offer you an opportunity to respond. Do you have something to uh, say about that at this moment, or should I go ahead and? No, I, I, think you, I think you pretty much summed it up. I think that's completely correct. I think that the, the, the depth and breadth of the badge, because it's a three-dimensional element, uh, you know, anything that creates greater, greater validity or gives a greater glimpse in, in, to its authenticity and the depth and breadth of, one, of an outcome, is, is a positive thing, and I think that's where the endorsements will play in. You know, if you've, if you've, uh, if you've taken a course at Penn State, you, you ask with flying colors, and it, and it's the uh, you know that's ratified by an endorsement from an agency exterior. That's a good thing for the student. That creates marketability. That creates currency. That I think is valuable. And and I think you'll what you'll see in badging ultimately is classes of currency. Um, I think you'll think there'll be some that will have well, certain badges will have inherently more value than others. And they certainly won't. Level the playing field. Right. Well, there's certainly already an inherent in our current existing model, right? I mean, we believe. Uh, I, I had this uh, uh, conversation with a HR person um, at a Christmas party, and I said, if I gave you a student who had 50 badges and showed the evidence right out of college that they could do the job, versus a Harvard grad with the same degree, with a degree. Who would you hire? If you're still going with Harvard. Yeah. Okay. And 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 so so the point is is that they and she's the head of HR in a very big institution. So so until they get that feeling and that confidence, okay. Uh, but yet I spoke to a small company. Uh, same conversation. A uh, woman who uh, actually a woman-owned company uh, of uh, 75 people. I said, who would you hire? And she said, I want the person who's got the experience. So it's all about the lens, right? What you who you look through, because that person knows that I don't have to train all that person on all those things. Versus, and that's not saying that the Harvard person can't learn and he's a pastor, but I think given those two sets of things, until I start hearing that question sway in one way or the other, I think we still have a, we have a challenge, and, and, and that's why we're out here talking about it. Uh, do you have any hope uh, to integrate with uh, Coursera or other similar new platforms through the OPI? Uh, so, so we're agnostic. Okay, so it will be up to them if they decide to adopt our method. They will okay. adopt our method. <laughs> so, <laughs> have you talked to them already? Uh, we, we're not. They're, they're aware that we exist, but uh, now they may have, you know six months they kicked the company off. You know there are there are ways to approach those markets carefully. And, I mean, Coursera is doing some things from LinkedIn uh, already with badging, um, and uh, that's great because they'll eventually find out where the holes are. Okay, uh, when we publish our spec uh, to the open, we're going to make it open uh, in part of the open community. Uh, then the opportunity will be there. What we're going to do initially is, whether it's Coursera or whoever, find some initial stakeholders that will move the needle enough to take notice. And then the rest will either come or they won't. 
you know, it depends on how far they're embedded into their own systems. I know conversion is tough, but we're going to make our API such that they'll be able to import Mozilla compatible badges and then take advantage of all the things that we're going to do. So are you trying to push this ecosystem of like a developer like you? Yeah, along exactly. Like, we're going to have hack fest, the whole thing. Yeah. We're going to be a big old love. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I, I have a question that I... There's some I, things, too. I see people posting some things, that, some pictures from YouTube and things like that, so I'm not sure what those are. But, uh, a lot of the like, comments are me. Chris has probably been following us, okay. if not making most of us. Okay. Feel yeah. free to bring this yeah. stuff yeah. out. Yeah, I'd like to know what, what, what this YouTube thing is. And some, oh, I'm no. sorry. I, I have a question, sure. um, but I suspect the answer is proprietary. Okay. Um, I'm interested to know... Um, about the development of your system. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to know um, what types of people have been building it uh -huh. and how large is your workforce? Mm -hmm. um, how, many, how many people does it take to build such a system and what types of yeah. skills do they need? Well, I, I would say that there, there's, there's deep, deep, deep in standards-based programming. Okay, so all the people that are working on that are committed to open standards. So that's the number one important thing. So we have people who actually sit on the in the WC3 board, okay, on various very, uh, validation boards. So we are making sure that we're bringing to the table someone uh, a product that will be past those standards, okay. They're not just today's standards. Right. We're 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 mediating for standards that are five and ten years away. Right. As, as we right. Build the platform. So we want to make sure important. that we're we're going to have technology that's going to go long, the long run. Okay. That's why we're going open in those t and making sure that we're building on top of Nothing we're going to write is going to be proprietary in the use. Okay, What will be proprietary is the algorithms that we have behind it, but that will be transparent to the user. Okay, That will be our proprietary. We want to make it open so that people will be able to consume it. We want people to be able to act. Questions? Yeah. Pat, anything from you? Or how do you, any reactions? She's standing with her arms closed. I don't are know we, if I like we, that. Are we dead wrong? <laughs> do you understand? Are we crazy? No, you're not crazy. Um, maybe a little bit before your time. Yeah. There's a whole host of things that I can comment and, and talk about. Um, but being very interested in comprehensive-based education. My background is in training and development, but I also um, teach in the higher education. Uh -huh. So my world is competency based. You know, I come from the training and development world. Sure. Um, here's one of the things I've discovered recently. We don't have a common definition of competence and competences, particularly in higher ed. What I bring with me from my old background somewhat differently um, perceived than what happened here. So we have some challenges at that very basic level. Um, and we need systems to be able to scale what we do. We've got a tremendous amount of folks out there who have prior learning in their background. Um, not work experience, but learning. Things that are not credentialed, and we need to be built to be able to do that. And I can rattle off a whole host of places that we're just waiting to figure out how we can do this. Um, it doesn't align well with the three credit course system. In chunks and pieces. And so when our military folks want to come into higher ed, and I'm saying um, that on a global level, not in Penn State, but mm -hmm. any higher ed, um, they bring a tremendous amount of knowledge that's credentialed in their world, and the currency isn't the same because we're still in the credit currency, and they can't bring it in. Mm -hmm. And so that's not only frustrating for them, it's frustrating for us. Um, so there's a whole host of but yeah, I've got a lot of I've got a lot of questions sure. about how this works and, and what you're doing. Um, here's one right now. Mm -hmm. um, when will when will this system be ready? Let's assume right now I, I think it's great. I want to try it. We want to use it. When, when you can usually you can currently use it and test it um, for free in the LMS at Canvas, and, it, and it's available to produce badges currently. Uh, and it, for a more robust, uh, by April, the backbone will be ready to plug in. Um, and there will have some um, form of a badge management system uh, or badge production system, but it's really only a test environment. We're not going to be in the business of actually generating the badges. We're going to leave that up to the institutions to create for how they see fit. Um, 
but there will be something that people can use to test in. As you said, we're very early in the market. The adopt as we come up the adoption curve, so we're going to help people stimulate that. Um, so you know, this by the summertime, we're we're full blown. We're ready to help, and we can help now. I mean, we we can test now, but we can help completely. We can switch on for an enterprise wide client like J and J, for example, uh, by the summer. So what clients are? I wouldn't be at liberty to discuss any client relationships. <laughs> Yeah. So they're, they're big stakeholders. So we're that early stage. Right. All, and, you know, all, all of them who are realizing the same the same problem, right? Yeah. They're all saying we we've got we see the promise, so we're going to put a, a stake in the ground. I mean, you just saw Pearson talk about it. They're doing diving now. Um, you're seeing, um, and, and they they come out with whatever. It's still you can sign up and wait for it to show up yet. Okay. Um, you're seeing people dabbling, so it's starting to take notice. So, we, you know, we're we're aligning our troops. People are making a, a alignments. We're participating in an event next uh, two weeks in in uh, San Francisco, which is a whole event where uh, the Secretary of Education will be there. Bill Clinton is expected to be there. Where it's all about Badger, and so I will be in attendance. Are you coming? Yeah. Yeah, he'll be there. So I mean, anybody who's in Baghdad is going to be there. So we're going to hopefully hear more of this move up, move along, and 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 that's. I didn't know Bill. Your military to education. I, I heard it might be has come up twice now um, with very significant um, enterprise Thank you, sir. Our customers wanting to integrate some of the um, great people who come out of that, and they have no ability to translate, as, as you said. And certainly, I mean, you've got these these great young people that come out that have a significant amount of training and intellectual property right there. But how do you convert it? Into something that's digestible so that they can enter the system. We're probably, I'm sorry, we're probably going to need to wrap the, uh, the broadcast up and yep. uh, head on. Um, but thank you. I'd like to uh, thank Eric and Bob for joining us today and for uh, the pioneering work you're doing in that field that I think is really important. Well, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Sure. And thanks to everybody out there online too. We'll uh, we we'll get a recording edited and posted after a, after a bit. So stay tuned for that on the Coil website.